Tonight's topic, FAQ, Frequently Asked Question. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you will speak to our hearts tonight. Help us to understand exactly what it is you desire from us. And then by the stately steppings of your Holy Spirit upon our hearts, empower us to obey that which you prescribe. Thank you for the power. And thank you for the victory that you will bring to us tonight. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. FAQ, frequently asked questions. Just remember, I think my ringer is on. Let me turn off this phone before I begin. I don't want that to disturb the service. You know in court they charge you, right? Yeah, so let me make sure that is not done in church. I want to begin the message tonight by pointing out to you that the acronym or letters FAQ is an IT or internet abbreviation for frequently asked questions. And it is a list of typically recurring questions that people ask often about a particular product or a site on the internet and the corresponding answers to those questions. Now, I particularly like creating an FAQ simply because I do not like to have to repeat the same information to persons over and over again. And therefore, it is particularly fulfilling for me to be able to point somebody to ready-made answers that they can go and read for themselves. Very often when a member of the family may ask, what does this word mean or how do you do this? I will say to them, if you Google that, Google will give you the answer. Because over the years, Google has been able to collect frequently asked questions and the answers or solutions to those problems. Are you still with me, church? So typically speaking, people may ask, how do I return an item that I've bought online from Amazon? How much does it cost for delivery at your store. How do I open an account with your bank or your credit union? How do I create a particular segment? How do I e add email addresses to an email listing? And for every one of these typically reoccurring, frequently asked questions, there are a list of answers to every one of them. Having said that, I want to discuss with you tonight a frequently asked question in the context of the New Testament. Let me begin with a story of significance. The story says that there was a rich merchant who lived in the city Baghdad. And he had a servant whom he was accustomed sending into the marketplace to purchase the household wares and the groceries. On a particular day, he sent his servant down to the marketplace with a long list of things he was supposed to purchase. And this is not a real story, it's an allegory. And the allegory says that while the servant was in the city of Baghdad, he saw death standing in the marketplace. And he was afraid of death. So he aborted, truncated, cut short his shopping mission and returned home to his master. He said, master, master, 
I saw death this afternoon standing up in the marketplace. Master, could you kindly lend me your white horse that I may ride off into the sunset and escape death? The master says, sure, I will lend you that white horse. But the shopping was not complete. And so later that afternoon, the master himself went into the city center to complete the shopping. And guess what? There in the marketplace, he also saw death standing there. And he went over to death and he said to death, listen, death. My servant was down here earlier this afternoon to do the shopping. Why did you frighten my servant so? To which death responded, I did not mean to scare him. I was surprised to see him in Baghdad because I know I have an appointment with him tonight in Samaria. And the moral of the story is, you can run, but you cannot hide. In case nobody has ever told you, you are going to die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Are you with me tonight, church of God? Everybody who does not live until Jesus Christ comes will die. And I want to suggest to us in here tonight that because of this harsh yet morbid reality, it would make sense for us to prepare to meet our dying day. Am I right or am I correct? The Bible, however, offers hope. Whereas the Bible tells us in Romans 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. We go on uh, to hear from God, but the gift of God, somebody ought to say amen tonight, is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Did not God say to his people, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. And the only way to accept uh, to make efficacious in your experience, the gift of eternal life is to accept the Savior, Jesus Christ. Eternal life, therefore, is a gift, a free gift that comes from the hand of God to everybody who will accept it. In Scripture, therefore, when Jesus was upon the earth and the apostles were leading the church, the most frequently asked question was what must I do to be saved? Are we on the same page tonight? What must I do to be saved? I will go through the New Testament tonight and I will search for that frequently asked question and I will give you the responses that the scripture gives. Follow me on this tour. First, I offer you Paul's answer to the FAQ. The Apostle Paul, he and Silas were preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. They were stoutly forbidden from doing so. And when they disobeyed, claiming we ought to obey God rather than man, they were captured, arrested, and put in prison. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16, verse 23 to 31, that this is what occurred. If you can see it with me, church, read out loud as we go through it together. The Bible says, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them where? In prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Verse 24, the jailer, who having received such a charge, what did he do, everybody? He thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks, hands in chains, feet in chains, 
in the deepest, darkest part of the dungeon, arrested for serving Jesus, for proclaiming his name. The Bible says that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. What else did they do, church? And they sang praises unto God. I wish I had somebody up in here tonight who knows that when you are blue and sad and depressed, that singing the songs of Zion lifts the burdens. Am I right about that tonight, church? Somebody said, sing the clouds away. Night will turn to day. If you sing and smile and pray, you'll smile the clouds away. That is what they did, exactly what they did. And at midnight, they prayed and they sang unto God. And the Bible says that all the prisoners heard them. We are now at verse 26. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. We serve a God tonight who is in the business of breaking every chain and setting the oppressed free. Verse 27. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, what did he do? He drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. It was the understanding for the Roman guard that if a prisoner escaped from you while on duty, do not report it to the commandant. Don't tell the officer anything. Just kill yourself so that they wouldn't have to kill you. So the man draws out his sword to do justice. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do thyself no harm, for we <laughs> are all still here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out of the jail. And then pronounced the frequently asked question to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Are we on the same page tonight, everybody? The jailer was so impressed that although Paul and Silas were now free from their bands, although it took them a while to wake up, although it took them a while to get to maximum security, the prison doors were already opened and the Christians were having church praising Jesus, singing the songs of Zion. More, more about Jesus. I want more, more about Jesus. I imagine in my sanctified imagination, they started to sing, wouldn't it be a time when we get over yonder, sing and shout, dance all about. When we get over yonder, sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Tell me more about Jesus. More of his goodness. More of his mercy. More of his love for me. They were so happy in the presence of God in the prison that they refused to break jail. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying to you tonight. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. I want to say to my church that in the presence of God, there is the fullness of joy. <laughs> and at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Hallelujah! 
we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Are you with me tonight? Are you with me tonight to a church? Redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Sing the songs of Zion. They lift your spirits and they set you free. The jailer was impressed that men could move the arm of God by singing the songs of Zion. He was impressed that they did not try to escape. He was grateful that he did not have to kill himself. He was impressed and he wondered what is it that had these men so joyous in adversity. They had something that he wanted. And so the frequently asked question came out of his lips. Essentially, he was saying, how can I get what you have? <laughs> Some Christians are so sour, Pastor. Huh? They're so sour, so angry, so vexed. So depressed, so burdened that the God they talk about and preach about, nobody wants that God. But I understand that I'm a witness for Jesus. And I have a responsibility, whether the rain falls or the sun shines, in fair weather or in foul weather, whether it's hot in Barbados or cold somewhere else, I've got to be a Christian. Are you hearing what I'm saying? My Christianity is not circumstantial and seasonal. It does not move with the tide up and down. It does not come with the seasons. My Bible tells me that in season and out of season, I must preach the word of God. I must be focused and centered in Jesus. Sure, there will be bad days, but with Christ in the vessel, I can smile at the storm as I go safely journeying on. Christians, give a good witness to those who don't know God. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Your marriage is broken, but smile at the storm. Your body is sick, but smile at the storm. Your children are recalcitrant and disobedient, but smile at the storm. The devil is on your case. Call him a liar and smile at the storm. If our God cannot keep us, in dark, dreary places. How can we recommend him to anybody else? Are you hearing me tonight, church? And when the jailer saw that, he says, I want some of this stuff. How can I get it? Essentially, that is how he was asked because he perceived. He knew, in fact, that these men had been cast in jail by summons of writ. That the magistrate had commanded and ordered that they keep the peace. That they be held over until the trial should come. They were on remand. And he knew it for preaching about Jesus. He had heard how Jesus had cleansed lepers, opened the eyes of the blind, unstopped the ears of the deaf. And he perceived that because of Jesus, these men were different. How can I be like you? How can I get my soul saved? And I believe that deep within the heart of every man, this is a frequently asked question. How can I be saved? I want to let you know tonight that you cannot save yourself. There is a savior. And this savior sets up the rules by which you must be saved. It is not the pastor. It is not the church. It is not some bishop or priest or, or, or pope. It is not the old be a man. It is God that sets up the standards that we must meet in order to be saved. Stop looking for excuses. 
Stop trying to find another path. Stop trying to go around what God says. Stop trying to find some mistake in order that you can justify your own means of salvation. It's not your heaven. It's not your salvation. Your blood wasn't shed. It's Christ's blood. It's Christ's sacrifice. It's God's heaven. It's God's earth. And he has a right to tell us how to live. My business is not to scrutinize and criticize and, and tear down God and tell him, no, it can't be like that. Now, there's a tremendous example of this. It's, it's kind of irrelevant, but it makes the point that I want to, to make tonight. But this is it. They asked Jesus, for what cause should a man divorce his wife? Do you remember they asked him that? Wicked guys. Because they wanted to divorce their wives. And they're looking for an answer so they can do it. Jesus said, listen, when I married them in the garden, I didn't plan for any divorce. Huh? There's no graduation for marriage. It's a one-way door. You're going, you don't come out. Jesus said, when I did it, that's what I intended. Are you hearing me? He said, but by the hardness of your hearts. They asked, why did Moses say to write her a bill of divorcement? A decree nicey, a decree absolute. Why did Moses say do that? Because your hearts were hard. And because you were treating women badly. And because when you left them, nobody else would take them. So give them a bill of divorcement so that people will know it was not their fault. That's what it was. Literally, that's what it was. Because women were property. Nobody wanted them after a man left them. It had to be because there was some iniquity or problem with them. And Moses said, no. You are leaving the woman because you see somebody else that you want. Right? A letter saying that there's no fault in this woman so that somebody else can have her. You understand what Moses did? Because your heart was hard. That's what Jesus said. And then Jesus said, but I tell you, only if there is fornication and adultery in the marriage should you leave your spouse. That's how I've ordained it. He said, but if you leave, Know this. You have to stay by yourself. You cannot remarry. This is what Jesus says. Peter opened his mouth. He says, well, Lord, if this is the way it is, it's better not to be married. Do you get the human response to what God is saying? Isn't that what we do all the time? Well, Lord, it's better not to be a Christian. If I have to give up the hog meat, it's better not to join. Are you hearing me tonight? Can I preach it straight or must I sob soap it so that you can feel comfortable? Should I tell you the truth? There are people who do not want to be Christian because they find that the requirements are too strict. And it's better therefore to stay away. When God sets up a standard for salvation, it is not man's responsibility to try and amend it or to reduce the requirement. Our responsibility is to accept. We can reason things out very well. Very, very well. Until nothing more is sacred. And everything is conditional. Not upon God's word, but upon what we think. I saw a book in the Adventist Book Center, a Apple book store in Barbados many years ago. God says, but I think. I saw another movie where a man told a woman, when I want your opinion, I will give it to you. Now that's a bad marriage. That's a bad marriage. But hear what I'm saying. God gives us instructions. God says, but I think. 
God says the seventh day is the Sabbath, but I think I will celebrate the resurrection on Sunday. God didn't ask us to do that. He says, keep the Sabbath. Nowhere in scripture will you find any command to honor the resurrection. But you will find a command to honor the seventh day. God says, but I think. God says that these things are bad to eat, but I think that they were only for the Jews. Don't you know what will kill a Jew will kill you? Don't you know that if something is unhealthy for a Caucasian, it's unhealthy for a black? Do you know if wine gets an Indian man drunk, it gets anybody drunk? What's wrong with us? Trying to figure things to suit ourselves. To suit ourselves. But the man asks the sincere question, what is it that I must do? In order to be saved. Huh? And what did they say to the man? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. That's Paul's answer. To what must I do to be saved? I want to say up in here tonight. That the only person who can save you is Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, the Bible tells us at verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is none other name on the heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only Jesus, only him, brings redemption. Are you still with me? Only Jesus. So we have to listen to him. So Paul's answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Last night I told you, tonight I remind you, that the rich young ruler also asked this frequently asked question. Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? It's the same question. What must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe in Jesus. Jesus answered the rich young ruler and said to him, if you will enter into life, if you want to experience salvation, keep the commandments. Now, these two things are not at war with each other. They are parts of a whole. Paul is right. Believe in Jesus. But Jesus is also right. Keep the commandments. For faith without works is dead. And let me drop this in here. Now when we say commandments, we normally refer to the 10 commandments found in Exodus chapter 20. I want to point out to you that those commands are called the Decalogue, the 10. But I wish to remind the church tonight that there are many other statements in scripture where God commands obedience to various other things all of them in one way or another can be linked back or tied back to the 10 but i want to disabuse your mind of the idea that there are only 10 statements now hear what i'm saying i'm not saying there are more commandments i'm saying god has given more instructions as amplification of those commandments do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, you don't see that in the 10, but it is a command from God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Huh? Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Do not defile your bodies because they are the temple of the living God. You will not find that specifically stated in the 10. But elsewhere in scripture, you see God giving orders and instructions. God giving statements that he wants us to practice. So do not confine yourself to the idea of ten rules. Everything else, I must confess, fits into the ten rules. Because if you eat badly and smoke 
and drink, you're killing yourself. And the commandment says, don't kill. Are you listening to what I'm saying? And if you run off with some man's wife or somebody's husband, the commandment says, no fornication, no adultery. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you, church? And if you marry outside of your faith and belief system, you are not honoring God in placing first in your life. Now, did you hear me tonight? <laughs> so Jesus said, obedience. Obedience is part of this, this, this whole, whole presentation. Chapter 19, verse 18 and 19. He said unto him, this is the rich young ruler asking Jesus now. I didn't mention this last night, but I'm going to mention it now. He said to Jesus, commandments? Rich. Do you mean the ones that the Pentecostal pastors in Barbados say have been abolished? Do you mean those ones? And Jesus said to him, thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. What was Jesus talking about? The ten. Is that clear to everybody? The ten. My Bible tells me the law of the Lord is perfect. If something is perfect, why are you getting rid of it? I have the best wife in the world. Anybody heard me? If for no other reason other than she is mine. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. I have a cat at home in Barbados. It's the best cat in the world. My cat. I drive a car. I used to drive one. It used to sputter and smoke. Break down every 10 minutes, but it's the best car in the world. Because it is mine. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? It's mine. Huh? I must not let my heart go after other people's stuff. I must cherish and value what is mine. But apart from she being mine... She is the best. The best. Sorry for you if you don't think so. I don't mean about her. I mean about yours. Without contestation. The best. Go home and love your wives. Wives, go home and love your husbands. Tell them that they're the best. And each of you must live for each other as though you are the best. Cook the best that you can cook. Wash the best that you can wash. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Do things with love. <laughs> we had a gardener. That will come to cut the grass at home. You know, turn over the soil and so on. Periodically. Once a month or whatever the case may be. And um, a time came when we lost him. Because he found another job and he got into something else. You know, made a little more money and so on. Can't blame a man for that. For trying to climb the social ladder. So he left us. And he was so apologetic. Pastor. Pastor, he was a member of the church. He said, Pastor, I'm so sorry, but I... I got this job and it's going to be 8 till 4 and I'm going to have to go to it and so on. I can't do this and the weekends are for the family. I can't come by anymore to do the lawn and, and so on and so forth. So I understood that. And he said, you're going to have to get somebody. So we went and we got somebody else. And my daughter came home. No, my son came home and saw what the new gardener had done. He said, Daddy, this was not done with love. He said, you can tell this wasn't done with love, daddy. You you, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Man, look, go home and love each other here. Life is too short. Jesus soon will come. There's no time for spouses to be fighting and warring with one another. Stop hitting the woman. Stop beating upon her. Hug her and love her. Tell her she's a queen in your house. Motivate, affirm her so that she responds to you. My Bible tells me, submit one to another in love. Amen. And I want to tell the men that you are in charge. Come on, push your chest up. <laughs> See a little boy over here, like five years old, pushing his chest up. Like. <laughs> Pastor, come on, push your chest up. 
Men, you are in church. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. But let me tell you, let me tell you, you are in charge of love. Yeah. You are in charge of forgiveness. Yeah. You are in charge of tenderness. Yeah. Think you're only in charge of money? Yeah. Huh? And sex. Think that's when you're in charge, huh? You are in charge of affection. You are in charge of social events. You are in charge of worship. Hmm. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The law of the law is perfect. I was making this point about Susanna. Got off a little bit, but the point is this. Nobody changes something that is perfect. Nobody dispenses with something that is utterly and totally good and satisfying. Are you hearing what I'm saying? No normal person does that. The law of the Lord is perfect. Why do we want to abolish it? Why? Why? Don't have any idols. What is wrong with that? But some people want that abolished because... You hear me? Do not make any graven images. Don't bow down to them. Don't serve them. There is one mediator between God and man. Jesus. We do not need any other saints. Are you hearing me? Mary, mother of Jesus, was a vessel that brought the Lord into this world. She's not to be worshipped. Are you hearing me? Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. He is to be worshipped. And my Bible says, through the words of Jesus, come to the Father in my name. We go to God in the name of Jesus. We don't have to ask anybody to pray for us. I mean, it is a bonus when you have a brother or a sister who shares the burden and prays with you and for you. But we don't need anybody to tell God nothing for us. Jesus says, oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Hallelujah. Great things he has done. I don't only preach from the Bible, I preach from the hymns. Jesus says in Matthew 5 and onward, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot, one tittle will in no, by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Jesus answered to the question, how is it that I can be saved? Paul said, believe in Christ. Jesus says, keep the commandments. First John chapter 2 and verse 3, and hereby we know that we know him, Jesus Christ, if we keep his commandments. James 2.10 is insightful and instructive. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Now, if you were being suspended from a tall building with 10 links of chain, each link representing one of the commandments, Will you tell somebody that the fourth one is only for the Jews? You know, that's what they say. The, the Sabbath is for the Jews. The, the other nine are for us. But the fourth one, wh 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 where does that come from? Does that even make any sense? Huh? The fourth one, the Saturday is for Jews. But, but the other things are for us? What kind of reasoning is that? That is the reasoning of somebody who wants salvation on their own terms. On their own terms. If I was in Barbados, I would tell such people, you're deceitful. But that's not something I can say in England. So let me move on. So the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Paul says, believe in Jesus. The rich young ruler asks Jesus, what must I do to be saved? 
Jesus says, keep the commandments. There is no war. They are parts of the same whole. On the day of Pentecost, Peter gave an answer to this frequently asked question. The Bible says that cloven tongues of fire came upon all that were in the house and they began to speak in other languages. And then when people saw this, they were impressed by the outpouring and the filling of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, they said to Peter and the disciples, the apostles now, men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, how must we respond to this sermon, to this outpouring of the Holy Spirit? What shall we do to be saved? It's essentially the same question. Peter's answer is found in the following verse, Acts 2 and verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul said, believe on Jesus. Jesus said, keep the commandments. Peter says, repent and go down in the water. And then receive the Holy Ghost. All of these are required as part of the salvation package. You believe in Jesus Christ. You obey his instructions and commands as best you can. And the Spirit of God helping you. You repent of your sins. You turn away from wrong. You do not try to justify bad behavior. You forsake it. So when Jesus comes into your life, you do not ask, what's wrong with parties? That is a person who is looking for an escape hatch. What's wrong? Been hog meat. Now Jesus said, don't eat that. It's right there in Leviticus. A whole list of nasty animals. And I want to suggest to you that of all the nasty animals, the pig is the nastiest. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now every creature on the earth serves a purpose. And some of them are placed here to pick up garbage. They are scavengers. They are not for eating. Anybody who has ever kept an aquarium knows that certain types of fish stay on the surface of the glass and at the bottom of the tank because they are waiting for what other fish drop. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Everything that we don't want to eat we give to a pig. And then we eat the pig. Are you hearing me tonight? A pig is a nasty creature. I don't care how sweet the meat tastes. The Bible says if it's not cloven-footed, if it doesn't divide the hoof, if it doesn't chew the cud, all three, it is unclean. The Bible says if it's in the water and it does not have fins and scales, it is unclean. Are you hearing me, church? Everything that, that is out there wasn't made for eating. And God knows that some things were put here for other purposes. I'm trying to figure out why we have mosquitoes. <laughs> A -a Anybody who figures that out, let me know. But, but, but. But the, but the reality is, everything has a purpose, and some things are not for eating. It's as plain and simple as that. We know it about plants. Some of them will poison you. And the same thing is true about meat. It kills you slowly. Every animal that is a carnivore, the cats, the dogs, all of them that eat meat, live no more than 10 to 12 years. You know why? 
the meat clogs the arteries and kills them. It's as simple as that. Animals that eat plant materials live longer. Not just human beings, others. Think about it. Don't take my word for it. Go and research it. Go and research it. Meat kills. Our teeth are not even designed to, to, to eat that thing. You don't have no long pointy teeth like lions. No, I'm serious. I, I didn't say that for laughter. It is a fact. We are not made for that. Even nature tells you that. I go to the supermarket in Barbados, and I don't see many people with vegetables in their carts. I see a whole heap of meat, all types. They have fish. They have lamb. They have goat. They have turkey. They have duck. Not a single carrot. No broccoli. And they come to a place in life when the doctor says to them, think about it. You need to stop eating like this. Now, if he's going to stop you from eating like that, you might as well practice it all along. And get this. All of what I just said is in the Bible. But people don't want it because it runs counter to what they really want to do. It interferes with their desires. And then they begin to rationalize things and make excuses. God says, but I think, I think, do you know better than God? The manufacturer says only a certain grade oil must go in the engine. Put orange juice because you think. Because you think. The manufacturer says, but I think orange juice is cheaper and it's prettier. It has vitamin C. Put it in your engine. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Now, all of those answers to the frequently asked question are correct. None of them is wrong. All of them are right. Paul tells us that when we come to Jesus, we must leave off what he calls the works of the flesh. Read out loud with me, please. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are, what are they? Adultery, fornication, and this simply means no sex with, with anybody to whom you are not married. No sex with anybody to whom you have not pledged your commitment before God. And in a service of dedication, you give that relationship to God. In the beginning, God brought the man and the woman together and blessed them. Don't you be joining up with anybody without the blessing of God. Come to God. Get the blessing. Hallelujah. Paul says, uncleanness, other sexual sins, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reverence, now, I can't, don't have the time to go through all of those. And I'm not cherry picking, but I want to emphasize the ones that I know people have trouble with. You see that reveling? You see that reveling? What is reveling? Party spirit. Party spirit. In the band, down behind the truck. Do y'all do that in England? Huh? Y'all don't do that here? Man in the Caribbean when we have carnival. Huh? You're some of the Adventists? You think you can fool me? You're from Trinidad, ain't it? Now hear me. In Barbados, they have these big speakers on the back of the truck. Here too sometimes. And they have carnival and kudumant and crop over. 
huh? And the Colossonians sing and the R&B and, and all of that. Some of the lyrics are not nice. Vulgar. And they bend their knees and arch their back. And the waist goes flip, flop, flip, flop, flip. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? I'm not saying this for laughter. I, I see you're enjoying it, but I'm saying this because I'm very serious. The Bible says, revelings. Party spirit. Vulgarity. What people call culture in the Caribbean. Nothing more than sexual experiences in your clothes. And they teach little children to do these things. And they clap at that and celebrate it. Vulgar. Vulgar. No Christian, no born again Christian has any right at those types of parties. You can come to my birthday party. You'll eat vegetables. <laughs> Vegan cake. <laughs> we'll play music, but it will not be vulgar. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It will not be vulgar. No, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. This is my opinion. And, and I, this is the first time you've heard me say that something is my opinion. Because it is my opinion. I have no authority for saying what I'm going to say. It is my opinion. Do not charge me with preaching falsely from scriptures. I have told you what I'm about to say is Hall's opinion. I believe that most dads is sensual, if not sexual. I believe that most dance is sex sensual, if not sexual. And I believe that I must not express my sexuality towards anybody else other than Susanna. And therefore... I will dance, but with my wife. Did you hear what I just said? Because I am allowed to express my sexuality in that context only. Only. I'm not holding on to nobody's woman. Exchanging partners. And all that stuff. And I deliberately said it like that. Raw and raucous for a reason. I want you to get what I'm saying. I don't mean to be offensive, but I want you to understand. And what I just told you is my opinion. Okay? Mine. You don't have to follow that, but that's how I see it. So, Revelyn, drunkenness. Look at the other ones, envying. Huh? Hating people for no reason. Wanting what they have. Strife. Wrath. Look at wrath. Anger. Hatred. Paul says, this is the way of the person who has not met Christ. Hmm? Good. Of which I tell you before, as I have told you in the times past, that persons who do such things, they're not going to heaven. That's what Paul says. <laughs> so there needs to be a change. Christians cannot live like people who are not Christians. There needs to be a difference. But some people don't want to make this difference because they find it too hard. They want to do these things and still Go to heaven. But the Bible says people who do these things will not go. And I can't change that. Now hear me. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to the church. Uh-huh. Baptism is mentioned 
80 times in the New Testament. The Greek word baptizo means to dip, to immerse, or to plunge under the water. John was the great baptizer. Jesus came to be baptized of John in the river Jordan. John protested, no, you are the son of God. I cannot do it. But Jesus said to John, let it be so now, for it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. Baptism is a symbol of total commitment, total repentance, total resolve, total acceptance of Jesus. And when you go down and come up, it fulfills all righteousness. Then John consented. Now, Jesus did not need to be baptized because he was pure and holy. But he did it as an example for us. The scripture says, and I love this, then he went up out of the water. And I want to point out to you that in order to go up, out of you must go down into and therefore biblical baptism is immersion in a large body of water sufficiently large to cover the person's entire body all at once it does not come in a basin or a cup or a hose it is not poured on your forehead or dipped in your fingers and massaged behind the ears or the forehead you've got to go down into the water and come up out of the water I am sorry to have to tell you tonight that if you were sprinkled you are not baptized according to the word of God the word of God says you have to go down and come up out of. And there's a reason. There's a reason. Adventist church does not baptize babies. It is cruel. We cannot put them under the water. It is not advised. We, we do baptize children who are old enough to understand that they are sinners and that Jesus is a savior. A child who can stand in the water. Hold his breath. Or at least know that it must not swallow when under the water. A child with intelligence who can accept the word of God for themselves. Let the little children come to me, says Jesus. Do not forbid them, you parents of Adventist children. The baptism is this Sabbath. Get them ready. Don't stand in their way. I have seen too many adults in my years as a pastor telling me that the 8, 9, and 10-year-old child is too young, too young to give their life to Jesus. And they will not allow the child pleading, Mommy, please, let me get baptized. Daddy, auntie, I want to give my life to Jesus. You're too young, they say. Then when the child gets 15 and 16 and you expect them to make the decision, they walk away. I've seen that over and over again. Suffer the little children to come. Do not stand in their way. And by the way, if you have parented a child for nine and ten years, and that child does not know about Jesus, it's your fault. Let me leave that alone. Let me leave that alone. Ellen White says, too much importance cannot be placed on the early training of children. The lessons that the child learns during the first seven years have more to do with the forming of character than all it, um, it learns in the future years. And then she says this, children of eight, I didn't say it, I repeated that because I knew she said it. Children of eight, 10 or 12 years are old enough to be addressed on the subject of personal religion. Do not teach your child with reference to some future uh, period when they shall be old enough to repent and believe the truth. If properly instructed, very young children may have correct views of their state as sinners of the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. Instruct your children. So the Bible says whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. That's the answer to the frequently asked questions. <laughs> But I'm going to skip some of this stuff because i got to end. There are other examples of people baptized in the scripture. 
there's the Ethiopian eunuch. Huh? I only want to point out tonight that, you see, he was riding along um, in a carriage with Philip. He was reading. And the Bible tells us the portion where he read came from Isaiah. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his peace was upon us, and with his stripes we are healed. And the Spirit said to Philip, go and join yourself to the carriage. And Philip went obedient to God, and he said to the black man, do you understand what you are reading? The black man was honest. He said, how can I? When there's no one to explain it to me. So Philip explained the word of God to the Ethiopian. And as he explained it to him, the man got so excited. The scripture says they came to a body of water. Huh? And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said to Philip, Look, here is water. What? Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders <laughs> to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. If the priest did not get soaking wet, when he baptized you, you are not baptized. The baptizer and the baptizee must both go down. Are you listening to me? Philip went down with him. Can't go down in a cup. Can't go down in a bowl or basin. You listening to what I'm saying? This Sabbath, we're going to provide enough water. Enough water, sufficient water to cover people. You cannot be baptized without going down into the water. And Philip baptized him. I want to make one more point about this and then I'm going to wrap this up. Hear me now. Hear me. There are those who say, and my frame of reference is always Barbados. I don't know anything about you. I've just met you. In Barbados, people will tell me, before I can be baptized, I should probably be registered in a Bible class. And I should probably study for three months. You, 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 you understand what I'm saying to you? I have made the observation that those baptismal class meet at most once per week. You're with me? Four weeks in a month. Multiplied by three months, 12 sessions. Tonight is the 12th session. Is anybody hearing me? It is an excuse. It is not a reason. It is an excuse. Tonight is the 12th session. By the time we are done, there will be 14 sessions. And I have tried my best to mix and match and preach a little bit of everything from this platform. You have been well exposed and you have no excuse. Do not try to pull the wool over my eyes and fool me that you need to be in some class for three or four months. Every night, I said something different. And I suspect that we have covered the vast majority of the fundamental doctrines of the church. I've touched them, preached them from left and right, up and down. Some people are saying to me, don't you get horse in the trot? Man, I ball like this for six weeks. And God keeps my voice. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Because I am convicted, convinced in the word of God. You have heard sufficient. The truth is the Ethiopian eunuch had one Bible study. If you know you are a sinner. And if you know Jesus is a savior. And if you are sorry for your sins, come 
and be baptized. Over the days and weeks ahead, pastor will teach you. Uh, Winsome will teach you. Derek will teach you. The people in the church through the Sabbath school lesson will teach you. And you will grow in knowledge and in grace. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And you Adventists don't be telling people about no six months. Don't be contradicting what I preach up here. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Because what I'm telling you is the truth from the word of God. You don't need no six month course. Paul was baptized by immersion. Hmm? Paul was baptized by immersion. I'm coming down. I want to finish in a flurry by telling you where we started, we will end. When the jailer saw that Paul and Silas had something he wanted, he says, what do I have to do? And they said to me, if you believe, <laughs> you can be, you can be saved, you and your whole house, if you believe, you can be saved. The Bible says, and they took him. Now, remember when our story started, it said it was midnight, <laughs> right? My Lord have mercy, midnight in England. Huh? Temperature six above zero. Are you hearing me, church? <laughs> and Paul Lightbird tells the Philippian jailer, if you believe, same hour so this is before 1 a.m because when the story starts it's midnight and if he took them the same hour one o'clock in the morning huh paul silas the jailer and his family are down in the ice chill water baptize me people should be running down this aisle tonight you may not know it, but I understand there is a fountain filled with water underneath this platform. You should be running down here tonight saying, Pastor Paul Lieberg, baptize me. Baptize me. But we're not going to do it tonight. We have scheduled it for Saturday. We have scheduled it for Saturday. Get in the water. Get in the water. Hallelujah. Baptism is a symbol representing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The Apostle Paul tells us, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? He goes on. We were therefore buried with him in baptism, when you go down, it represents the death of Christ. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, when we come back up through the glory of the Father, we too may live and rise to walk in newness of life. That's where I stop tonight. And let me say to the Pentecostal pastors in Barbados, Jesus did not ask us to honor any resurrection. But he did say, get baptized. And the baptism honors the resurrection. Because when you go down, you die with Christ. When you come up, you rise with Christ. What Jesus gave us to remember his death, burial, and resurrection is not Sunday. It is baptism. I'm ready to close. We're going to pray about this tonight. Are you ready, church? One question. The frequently asked question is, what must I do to be saved? All those who want to be saved tonight, just raise your hand for me, please. Take your hands down. So here's the answer. 
if you want to be saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep the commandments. Repent. Confess. Be baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit. Those are the biblical answers to the frequently asked question. Do you want it tonight? If you want to be saved, stand with me and meet me at this altar for our closing prayer tonight. No singing. No emotionalism. If you want this, if you want salvation, believe Keep the commandments. Be baptized. Repent. Receive the Holy Spirit. Don't block the aisle. Come as far as you can. Come as far down as you can. Hallelujah tonight. Sister Winsome, do you have any of those bits of card or paper where people can register tonight their commitment for baptism. You've come tonight for prayer. I am going to pray with you. I have but one more appeal. Is there anybody here who wants to say, Pastor, I see it. It's clear to me. I see it. I need to get my life in order. I need to join and become a part of a Bible-keeping, commandment-experiencing, faith, Christian church that upholds the word of God. I recognize I need to do that. If there's one person here tonight who is saying, Pastor, pray for me. There are struggles, there are problems, there are difficulties, but I recognize I need to do it. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed at this time. If that is you, I'm not asking you if all the struggles have been put away. I know you're struggling. I know there are problems. I know your family doesn't want you to do it. I know that your friends may jeer and laugh at you. I know this. But if the Spirit is speaking to you tonight, and you hear that voice of God saying, repent, tonight, now is the day of salvation, you should Take that step to become baptized, to repent, to believe, to have faith, to receive the Holy Spirit. You should take that step to secure your salvation, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you are experiencing that struggle tonight and you need us to pray for you particularly because you want to be baptized but you're struggling, raise your hand quickly and put it back down. God will see and I will see. Raise it and put it down if that's you. If that's you tonight, just quickly, one finger, up and down, up and down. You want to have a conversation with somebody, you want to talk about it a little more. You're thinking about it. You're struggling, but God is saying, do it, do it. If that is you tonight, I'm asking you to raise your hand where you are. I will see. I will see. God will see. And we will respond to have that conversation with you. Is there anybody tonight? Raise your hand and take it back down. Praise God. Even after the meeting is ended tonight, you can still speak with the pastor. You can still speak with the Bible worker, Sister Winsome. You can still speak to one of our elders or maybe one of our members or a friend who brought you here. You can still chat with somebody. Heavenly Father. We thank you tonight that you are in the business of saving people. The scripture says it is not your desire that any should be lost. But that every man, woman, boy, girl should come to repentance. Father, we love you. Because you first love us. But we have struggles, oh God. We have problems. We have challenges in our life. We have people and circumstances that bind us. But you have said in your word, we cannot love people more than you. We cannot love mother and father more than you. 
We cannot love things, whether it be diet or jewels or party spirit. We cannot love anything more than you. So help us tonight, O oh God, to win the struggle, to win the battle. I know there are people here who want to give their lives to you, but there's something, something, Lord, some barrier, some hurdle, some river that they need to cross. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ tonight in their life. I'm asking you to make a way. Because, Lord, you're accustomed doing it. You made a way. When our backs were against the wall. And we thought that it was over. Lord, you made a way. And now we are standing here. Only because you made a way. And if you did it for us, oh God, you can do it for them. Break every chain. Cast out Satan. Bind evil in this place tonight. Remove obstacles. Tear down strongholds. Cast out foes. Hallelujah. Sabbath is the baptism. Lord, make your people ready to receive the baptism. We praise you now because we know you're going to do it. We know there will be victory in somebody's life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.